shall not be moved. I shall not be moved just like a tree planted by the water. I shall not be moved on my way to glory land, and I shall not be moved on my way to glory land. like a tree planted by the water I shall not be Jesus is my Savior, and I will not be moved. Jesus is my Savior, and I will not be moved. Just like a tree planted by the water, I shall not be moved. be to God, I will not be moved. Glory be to God, now I will not be moved just like a tree planted by the water. I shall not be moved. I shall not, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree planted by the water, I shall not be moved. No, I shall not be moved. Hello, brothers and sisters of Christ. Today we're going to be talking about who came up, Samuel, and we're going to be talking about that. So before we get into this, some of the brethren have been talking about how they miss singing hymns. They miss singing hymns. So we're going to sing a, a hymn to start this study, and we're going to end the study with a hymn. <laughs> All right. uh, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior hymn. So if you want to pause the video and look it up, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. Sometimes the words are different. Right. Sometimes I'll change a word because I don't like the words they use, like rapture and stuff like that. But remember, we're supposed to sing from the heart, and it's supposed to line up with God's word more than anything. Pass me not, O oh gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. Whilst on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. Whilst on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Let me at thy throne of mercy Find a sweet relief Kneeling there with a contrite spirit Help my unbelief Savior, Savior Hear my humble cry Whilst on others thou art calling do not pass me by.
trusting only in thy merit, would I seek thy face. Heal my wounded, broken spirit, save me by thy grace. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. Whilst on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Thou the spring of all my comfort, more than life to me. Whom have I on earth besides thee, whom in heaven but thee? Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. Whilst on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Whilst on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. It's a good song. I love this one of these old hymns. Never kneeling there in a deep contrite spirit. Help my unbelief. Remember the Bible says, God is nigh unto them of a broken heart, and save as such that be of a contrite spirit. Help my unbelief. It reminds me of the Bible where those men, uh, the man there where his son was uh, possessed by devils, and he's like, do you believe? And he's like, help, I, I believe, Lord, help thou mine unbelief. Okay. But a lot of these songs are great songs to sing, and I do miss singing with the brethren. I do miss singing with, you, with the brethren. I really do. So, we're going to get into this. Okay, before we open this, though, you can pause the video and turn here if you wish. But Amos, Amos 8.11. We're going to do kind of like a, a rabbit trail. We're going to get into this. Who came up? Samuel. Okay. Amos 8.11. Behold, the day cometh, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst of water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Hearing the words of the Lord. That's what the famine is. And i got to express this, brothers and Christ, a famine doesn't mean there is no food. It's kind of hard. People think famine, and I did too at one time. I thought famine meant no food to be found. No, it means there's little. There's very little. So little that you have to declare a famine in the land. There's so little food in the land you have to declare a famine. Okay. But the famine here is of hearing the words of the Lord. And I believe Amos is talking about the time of Jacob's trouble, Daniel's 70th week. Okay, more than anything. And in that time period, there's going to be people that hear the word of the Lord, but it's going to be of such a small amount that you'd have to declare a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. Remember, you have the 144,000 that are sealed in their forehead, and then the Jews to the side of that, and the Gentiles, very little, a very small remnant is going to make it through that time period that's going to hear the word of the Lord, and so small that God is declaring a famine on hearing the words of the Lord. Verse 12, And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from north even to the east, they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. Now remember, the Bible says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. The laws of God are written on every man's heart. God's word, I still believe, will be available in the time of Jacob's trouble. Some people believe, and I disagree with them, but some brethren believe that the Bible's going to be gone. Uh, no. Or very scarce. A famine on the Bible. No, it's famine on hearing the Word of God. I believe the Bible will be there, but what you're going to be dealing with people is ever learning and never came to, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Ever learning. Okay? The truth is right here, but they don't want to hear it. That's the famine. They don't want to hear it. Are we seeing a lot of that today? People don't want to hear the truth. Yes. But it hasn't gotten to the point where God says, enough's enough, come up hither, we go up hither, and then that famine really sets in of hearing the word of God. But you have ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Uh, 1 John 4, 5 says, They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. They want the world's truth. The truth that they're seeking is the world's truth. And they claim they're seeking God's truth. 
Remember what Jesus said? They kill you thinking they do God's service. You know the first person to, uh, when Jesus said that, you know the first person to fulfill that? Saul. I don't know if he was the actual first first person, but in the Bible it was Saul, later, uh, later Paul. Okay? Saul was his Jewish name, Paul was his Gentile name. But Paul, you know, the apostle to the Gentiles, before he got saved, he was killing Christians thinking he was doing God's service. Okay? But you've got these people that, hey, they're seeking the Lord, but they're not finding it. Why? Because in their heart, they still want things their way. They want the lust of the flesh. They want this to conform to them. Another way of saying it is, remember the Bible talks about how God is the potter and we're the clay? Jesus is God. Jesus is the potter. We're the clay. Some people want this to be the clay. And they want to be the potter. And that's why they can't, they, go, they shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, and shall not find. I believe it's because they're seeking the word that they want. They don't want absolute truth. They want the truth that best suits them. Okay? They have the word, therefore speak. They have the word, and the world heareth them. John 8, 47 says, He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Another reason why they're going here to and fro, north and east, seeking the Lord, and shall not find it. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. Because they're not of God. Remember in the time of Jacob's trouble, you take the mark and you worship the beast, you're done for. You're not of God. You're not one of his. You'll never be one of his once you've taken that mark and worshiped the beast. They go hand in hand. But today, the reason people can't seem to understand, can't seem to find the truth is because they're not of God. The Bible says you need to get saved and born again, and you need to have the Holy Spirit, and He will guide you into all truth. The Holy Spirit guides us into all truth. We learn from men of God that speak as they are moved by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost, some men are called to teach and preach, and God opens the Scriptures to them and shows them the truth and shares it with you, and the Holy Spirit in you bears witness with the Holy Spirit that's in them and says, yep, that's it. That's it. But he that is of God heareth God's words. Luke eleven twenty eight. But he said, Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Now when we say but of hearing the words of the Lord, in the Old Testament there was times where it would say, Hearing the word of the Lord, did you hear the commandment? The reason they're asking that is because they're not following it. Because if they heard it, they would be following it. Or when it says they heard it, it's saying that they're following it. Okay? When you hear the words of the Lord, that means you're following it. The Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. This is the foundation. This is what we hide in our heart. This is what we live. This is what we stand for. Not the world. You therefore hear them not, because you are not of God. Therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. Okay? The three things that always get in the way of us trying to... will get in the way of the Holy Spirit trying to show us the Scriptures to put in our heart and to live and to stand for, what gets in the way is the lust of the flesh. Remember the three enemies, the lust of the flesh, the world... Lust of the flesh. Paul says, are we to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How we are dead to sin live any longer therein. We're not supposed to make provisions for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Flee fornication. Flee temptation. There's no te the temptation is... Uh, how does that verse go? There's no... My brain's kind of... There's no temptation that's taken as such as common to man, but will with the temptation provide a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. I know I might have butchered a little bit. Please forgive me, brothers, this Christ. But bottom line, we're supposed to put the flesh down so it doesn't get in the way of this. It doesn't get in the way of this. And it doesn't get in the way of our walk with the Lord. The world comes in and says, Oh, you can love the world and the things of the world. The Bible says, Love not the world, neither the things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Paul talks about fleeing idolatry. When does idolatry come in? When you start loving the ways of the world, and not the ways of the Lord. When you start to love things in this world more than the Lord, and you start sacrificing the Word of God, you start sacrificing your walk. If you're a man in ministry, you start fat sacrificing the ministry. You start sacrificing fellowship with brethren. What? For the world. 
Love not the world, neither things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. When you start falling in the trap of loving the world and idolatry, the love of God doesn't shine through you. Remember the whole armor of God? The, the armor of light? The love of God doesn't shine through you. The Bible says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. This, we conform to the Word of God. Remember, this isn't the clay. I know there's a lot of men out there in the Babel buildings, here, here on video platforms like YouTube, that think that this is malleable, that this is the clay, and I'm the potter. No, I'm the clay. Lord, you are the potter, I'm the clay. I'm to conform to you. What gets in the way of us conforming to the Lord and His perfect written Word? When you start conforming to the world. I'm looking all around behind me. When you start conforming to the world. Those are the two enemies. Uh, also it says, ye adulterers and ye adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore shall be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. When you start being a friend of the world, you start becoming the enemy of God. Okay? Your flesh can get in the way. The world can get in the way. Satan can get in the way and his ministers. Remember Satan transforms himself into an angel of light? Why? Because Jesus is the angel of the Lord. And he's the light of the world. He's the angel of light. But Satan wants to pretend to be Jesus. He's a counterfeit. He transforms himself into an angel of light, no marvel that his ministers also shall be transformed into the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Satan will come in, and Paul warns about doctrines of devils. He talks about putting on the whole armor of God, especially that shield of faith. Above all, taking on that shield of faith, that you may be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Satan will come in through good words and fair speeches. He'll come in and try to offer you things that you want. But there's a catch. you got to give this up. Just little by little. Not all of it. Just a little bit by little bit. When the world, he uses the world. He uses your flesh. And he tries to entice you and says, just a little bit. You just got to give it up a little bit. Now you need, I need you, if you want this second thing, you got to give up a little bit more. You want this third thing, you got to give up a little bit more. And next thing you know, you got men in ministry that are so far from this. you got brethren that are so far from this. They're part of the world, uh, organized religions of the world, false religions of the world. They, they line up more with the lost world and the satanic religions of the world, like Catholicism, the number one is the Catholicism, than they do with this book. This is the foundation. Brother says, Christ, are you staying in this book? Are you starting your day with this book? Are you ending your day with this book? Are you starting your day with prayer as you're praying over this book and then reading it? End your day with prayer when you finish reading it. Are you praying all day? Are you listening? You got, we got technology now. You can listen to Alexander Scorby. Read the Bible as you're working. There's no excuse for you not to be in this a lot every day. In the Word of God every day. You go and you pray and you talk to the Lord about what you read. About a study you watched. Okay? You need to spend more time in this book and less time in the stinking world. And you need to get back to fearing God. He's the potter. I'm the clay, instead of fearing this world. Getting a little bit ahead of myself. But we're going to get into Saul. 1 Chronicles 10.13. Go ahead and turn to 1 Chronicles 10.13. Remember, you can always pause the video and turn. I do that all the time because I love turning to every scripture that's mentioned and read it. And I need to. I, I must pause here and say, I need to because I need to make a confession. Um, I was watching a video that a brother in Christ did. Uh, did John... Um, did John preach isolation before the catching up? Something along those lines. And I was getting in there, and I was getting so frustrated with the brother in Christ because he kept changing the words of the Bible and kept saying that it said John was isolated in the island of Patmos. And I'm like, it doesn't say that. And I said, it, he's, he's, it says he's exiled, not isolated, he's exiled. So I was getting on to a brother in Christ for adding to the word of God. And I was talking to a brother in Christ, another brother in Christ. And I was like, it's frustrating because it's like, it's so easy to slip in. And that's like, 
I, I was telling, I can make the same mistakes. We've all made mistakes. I was like, it's so easy for something to slip in and saying, thus saith the Lord, when the Bible doesn't say it. And this morning, I got a, I got a message from that brother in Christ and says, hey brother, do you, do you realize that it doesn't even say he was exiled? I'm like, what are you talking about? Yes, it does. I've heard it preached a million times. John is exiled to the island of Patmos. John is exiled to the island of Patmos. I hear it so many times. Every preacher seems to want to preach it. Okay. It's Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation in the kingdom of patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos. I read that and went, uh-oh. Here I am getting on a brother for adding to the Word of God because he kept saying isolated. John's isolated. John's isolated. John's isolated. The Bible never said he was isolated, not once. And I was getting on to him, and I'm like, I'm making the same mistake he did. I'm taking what I heard from other people. And I need to get back into Revelation. I haven't read Revelation in a while. But it's still no excuse. I was like, wow. I'll read it again. I, John, who also am your brother and companion tribulation in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the island that is called Patmos. Now, why was he in the island? For the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Somehow it was a punishment of some kind. He was put in the Isle of Patmos. He's in the Isle of Patmos. Why? He's being punished for the Word of God, for standing for the Word of God, and the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible actually says. It doesn't say he was isolated. It doesn't say he was exiled. It just says he was there. Now some people say, well, it's a prison. It's a prison. It's a prison. Yeah, but once again, we can say, I think it's a prison. I think that maybe they're trying to exile him. But when you go to say, thus saith the Lord, the Bible says John was exiled. Does the Bible actually say he was exiled? I'm kicking me now. I was like, how could I have said that for so many years? Oh, that's right, because I heard this brother say it when he taught it. I heard this brother over here say it when he taught it. I heard that. I heard that. We need to be careful, brother, says Christ. Are we falling in the trap? I know this is, I don't believe it's for today, but for instruction righteous, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Is there a famine in the land? Are we starting to fail the Lord because we're starting to go with what sounds good? We're messing with the Word of God and making it sound like, you know, you have some men that are handling the Word of God deceitful. Paul says we are not as they that handle the Word of God deceitful, deceitfully. Peter says, uh, and, and we're going to get this study, I'm going to show a spot there where I, this is where I have to be patient. I believe that when you're handling the Word of God deceitful is when you purposely add or subtract from the Word of God because you're trying to push a narrative. You're trying to push a narrative that the Bible doesn't push, or you might be doing a good teaching. So I've heard brethren who do good teachings, but they need to just stick to what the Bible says. It backs up your teaching just fine if you stick to what the Bible actually says, but they start grabbing other verses that really don't apply to what they're teaching, and they'll twist it to, and change it to get to fit their narrative. Okay, And that's when you got people that, that when, when it's handling the Word of God deceitfully, that's usually the lost world. But among professing Bible believers, there's a lot of false converts, there's a lot of hirelings, there's a lot of wolves in sheep's clothing, and they are purposely handling the Word of God deceitfully. Okay? One of the biggest things is, is um, the Trinity. Okay? Chapter and verse on capital T, Trinity is a time I forgot. Like I said, I could have sworn, I read this over and over, I could have sworn it said he was exiled to the island of Patmos. No, it just says he was in the island of Patmos. Never said he was exiled. Never said he was isolated. And it reminds me that I just pulled what we get on the, the pagan trinity people, the Trinitarians. They'll read the verse that says uh, the, the Father and the Word and, and, and the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. This is the trinity verse. That's the trinity. But the trinity is not, it doesn't mention trinity. Trinity is nowhere to be found in the Bible as a title for God or a description of God. But when you hit these people up, it's there, it's there. Show me the verse. It's right here. Oh, see, people who love the truth, I did it. When I, when I was brought to the truth, I was using Trinitarian terms. And I needed to say, start using Bible, what the Bible actually says. And I was like, it's right here. 
Oh. They, they used to call this the, the Trinity verse, but you know what? It doesn't say Trinity at all. Oh, what? Trinity's not all in the Bible. I need to conform to this. This doesn't say John was exiled to the island of Patmos. I got a correction from a brother. Praise God. Praise God. I want to line up. I want to line up with this. I'm not. Up, I'm not against correction, brothers and sisters. Christ. Just remember, the heart has to be in the right place. If you're looking for a debate and an argument, you're you come into the wrong place. I'm telling you right now, you're coming to the wrong place. I'm not into debating or arguing. But if you're coming to correct me through the scriptures, that with your heartfelt intent, like my heart is, I want to line up with this book. I want to be right in God's eyes. I want to be doing things right that pleases God. And if you see a brother that's not doing right, by all means, show him the right. What's right? This brother showed me what's right, and he was right. He was 100% right. Okay. We've got to humble ourselves. I wonder if that's further down the road. Oh, or that was in the study. Wound, or the study. Hymn. It was in the hymn that we read. Heal my wounded, broken spirit. And it says, Kneeling there with a deep, contrite spirit, help my unbelief. Humbling yourself. Brother says Christ, we need to be careful that we don't start thinking more highly than ourselves than we ought to think. That's what Saul did. And we're going to get into that. That's what Saul did. We need to keep humbling ourselves and keep saying, this is the final authority. I'm not above accountability. I'm not above correction. Lord, I want to say things your way. And this isn't the first time a brother's caught me. And I thought I, I thought I was doing good. I'm really trying hard to stick with this book, Brother Says Christ, and only say it God's way. And I still failed. Through years and years of indoctrination, I failed. And I'm going to keep trying. And I'm, when I get knocked down, I'm going to get right back up. Lord, I'm sorry. I'm going to start saying it your way. John was just in the island of Patmos. Why? It was a punishment of some kind because for the... For the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Right. So 1 Chron First Chronicles 10.13. You might be asking, well, if we're going to talk about Saul and Samuel coming up, why are we going to 1 Chronicles 10.13? I want to talk first about why Saul had to die. Okay. First Chron why he lost the kingship. Okay. I believe Saul is an example of somebody in the time of Jacob's trouble that takes the mark and worships the beast. They lose that position. Okay. What's that position? Uh, God. God's saving grace. They lose that. First Chronicles 10.13 So Saul died for his transgression, which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord. A word of the Lord. He transgression which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord. When you transgress this, you're transgressing the Lord. If you're transgressing the Lord, I'd say 100% chance you're, 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 what does it say, even against the word, you're transgressing the word of the Lord. They go hand in hand. Which he kept not. Now today, our salvation is not based off of keeping the word, it's evidence of salvation, the changed life. Remember uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are created in, we, now that we're saved, for we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works that have before been ordained that we should walk in them. Right? If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away, but... Behold, all things have become new. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. All things have become new. Every part of my life, this is involved in every part of my life. I think we talked about this. I can't remember if it was James. Because I was reading one of the books. It was James or Jude. It had to do with talking about the, what, our attitude. We should not be swearing by heaven, for it is God's throne. And we're not supposed to be swearing by he, uh, earth, for it is his footstool. We're supposed to have the attitude, if it be thy will, O Lord, I'd like to get this done today. I sit down with the Lord and say, I'd like to get this done today. I'd like to get that done today. If it be your will, O Lord. Okay? That's supposed to be our attitude. We're not supposed to swear. We'll get into that a little bit too. But which he kept not. In the Old Testament, there was works. 
which he kept not, and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it, and inquired not of the Lord, therefore he slew him, and turned the kingdom unto David the son of Jesse. Okay. Now, we're going to go through this real quick. The first part, remember it talked about he transgressed, which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, and kept it not. And he asked counsel. We're going to get in the counsel of the, of the familiar spirit. Excuse me. But we're going to go to 1 Samuel 13, verse 8. 1 Samuel 13, verse 8. First Samuel 13, verse 8. And we're going to be going to 14. And he tarried seven days, according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me, and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. Now right there, if you know your Bible, only the Levites are supposed to give uh, the do the burnt offering. It's a command of God. Only the Levites. That's their inheritance. All the other tribes got land. The Levites didn't get any land. God was their inheritance. This is where he disobeyed the word of the Lord. And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, just right when he got done, if he had been patient, if he just waited a little bit longer, behold, Samuel came. You know what this reminds me of, brothers of Christ? The catching away of the body of Christ. The Bible says we're supposed to patiently wait for it. There are brethren that are falling away. Can you imagine falling away and, two, and five minutes late, like you're just falling flat on your face and you become lust, get into the lust of the flesh, you get into worldliness, you start turning your back on the teachings in this book for doctrines of devils, and ten minutes after you, you just give up and you fall flat on your face, God says, come up hither. If you'd have just waited ten more minutes. Patience. Patiently wait for it. We're supposed to stand, having done all to stand. That's why we put on the whole armor of God. That we can stand against the wiles of the devil and having done all to stand. If, if Saul would have just waited a few more minutes. Behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him, that he might salute him. Now stop. In his heart, he did nothing wrong. Oh, here's Samuel. Here's Samuel. I did nothing wrong. How's it going, Samuel? How's it going? And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And then Saul, okay, and Saul said, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me, he feared losing the people, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, Samuel wasn't there. And that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash. He feared the enemy. He feared his own people. Remember when we just talked about not conforming to the world and everything? What, what tries to get you to conform to the world? The enemy. The world. Sometimes your own people. Some brethren that have fallen away and conformed to the world. They'll try to get you to conform to the world. But he's fearing all these people. Therefore said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. He's not supposed to make it. He's supposed to have a Levite make it. I forced myself, therefore. First he comes down and acts like nothing's wrong. Hey, Samuel, what's going on? Then he says, I forced myself. Brother says Christ, God doesn't want excuses. And we're going to get into this a little bit further. But God doesn't want excuses. He wants you to come, humble yourself and come to Him and say, Lord, I'm wrong. I was wrong. I shouldn't have done what I did. I, I jumped the gun. I got antsy. I, I jumped the gun. And, and I, I did it without consulting the Lord. I did it. I don't want to get into this too much because we're going to get into Saul when it comes to um, acknowledge Him in all thy ways and what got in the way, which we're already talking about some of it, this fear of the people. His fear of the enemy. I forced myself before and offered a burnt offering. He has excuses. God doesn't want excuses. God wants you to humble yourself and say, Lord, I'm wrong. Remember uh, Job. If you remember reading the book of Job, when he, when God gets on to him says, Why are you questioning me? Have I not made all these things? And he goes through on how you know great God is. And 
when it gets back to Job's turn to talk, he says, I will speak no more but this one time and then no more. In other words, he's saying, I'm without excuse. I had no right to doubt you, O Lord, and I start questioning why you're doing things that you're doing, or allowing things to happen that you're allowing to happen. I had no right to question you. He also talks about, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Is that Saul's attitude? No. His heart was hardened. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Remember? Fool has said in his heart, There is no God. A fool is someone who's ungodly, not part of God, doesn't believe that there's a God. There is no God. But when the Bible says foolish, or foolishly, like here, it's saying you're acting like the heathens. You're acting like the lost world. Thou hast done foolishly. You're acting like these lost people around you. And if you get into the Bible a little bit further down the road, you have, I think, Jeroboam. He creates two calves to worship, golden calves, and then he kicks the Levites out of the priesthood, and he makes priests of the lowest of the people, the common people, that aren't Levites. What's he doing? He's acting like the lost world. But no shock there, because Jeroboam, he fled from um, Solomon into Egypt, which is a type of the world, and the Bible, Moses said, we're not to, the, the Jews are not to ever go back to Egypt. When we get saved, Egypt's a type of the world, we come out of the world. We're not supposed to go back. We're not supposed to resurrect the old man. We're not supposed to go back. He went back, and when he came out of Egypt, he was so messed up. He was acting foolishly. He was acting like the pagan people around him with false gods and false systems. Brother Jesus Christ, we need to make sure we're not doing that. We're staying true to this book. I started looking up to say, where's the Bible to hit? Oh yeah, it's right here. <laughs> uh, and Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandments of the Lord. Remember what it said up here? For his transgression which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he committed thee commanded thee, for now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever, but now the kingdom shall not continue, thy king, but, but thy kingdom, but now, if I can read right, but now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. And the Samuel rose and got up him from Gilgal and Gilboa of Benjamin. And Saul numbered the people that they were present with him, and about 600 men. And Saul goes on doing his thing. It's like, it's like whoosh, over his head, or whoosh, in one ear, out the other. No, oh, oh well. No, oh, oh well. But we see there he didn't keep the commandments of God. Uh, turn to Samuel, 1 Samuel 15. Just a couple chapters over. Did he learn from it? Did he learn from his mistake? 1 Samuel 15, verse 12. And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul, come to Carmel. And behold, he set him up a place, and has gone about and passed on and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul and said unto, and Saul said to, unto him, blessed, the, blessed be thou of the Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandments of the Lord. I have performed the commandments of the Lord. He got worse. First time he knew he did, he did wrong, but he said he forced himself. I had to force myself. He knew it was wrong. Now he's coming with such pride, thinking more highly of himself than he ought to think. And he's like, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And we'll get in what that commandment is. And Samuel said, What meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears, and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen. He blamed the people. He feared the people, and he wanted to please the people. To sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. And the rest we have uttered, utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord hath said to me this night. 
And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, was thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel? And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners and the Amalekites and fight against them until they be consumed. That was the commandment of God. They were to destroy everyone, including King Agag, destroy him down to the ground and fight against them until they be consumed. You know what this also reminds me of in 2 Kings? I can't remember all the kings, but there was a king that he went out to fight the enemy and the God gave him victory and told him that you're, you know, gave him victory over the enemy. And the next thing you know, he's making a pact with that king of the enemy and he makes a deal with him and lets him go his way. And then you hear the story about the, uh, the prophet. He, he tells someone, smite me, pray thee. And he wouldn't do it. And he said, because you wouldn't obey the commands of God. Uh, uh, as soon as you're out of here, a bear is going to kill you. I can't remember if it's a bear or a lion, but a bear is going to kill you. And it does. And then he gets, the, gets to the second person and says, smite me, I pray thee. And he does it. And then he acts like he's a wounded person. And he does this whole parable and everything. When God tells you to do something, you do it. When there's an enemy that God tells you to wipe out, you go and you wipe them out. You don't turn around and make deals with them. You don't compromise with them. Oh, we can all get along, go along to get along. Oh, we can agree to disagree. You know? You, you be content to, to, to practice your religion, and I'll be content to practice mine, and we can do it all together. No. No. And fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoils, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? Sometimes, what, I, we'll do this on the other study, but what keeps people from trusting the Lord with all their heart, leaning on their own understanding, but acknowledging Him in all thy ways, is when the Lord starts offering you things you want, things of the world. Oh, you want this? There's a catch. It's going to cost you. When the world offers you something, there's always a catch. That's why the Bible talks about the love of money is the root of all evil. It talks about for filthy lucre's sake. Some people are starting to turn their ministries into filthy lucre's sake. They're turning them into a business, a money-making business. They make merchandise of you. It all becomes about money. I remember hearing... Uh, some, some these guys in these Babel buildings, they're fighting over people that come to their building. This this building over here is trying to steal some of our congregation and everything. And, and blah, blah. Why? Because you're a commodity in the Babel buildings. You're merchandise. You're an income. They flow upon the spoils. What can get in the way of you acknowledging the Lord in all your way and doing things His way? Bribery. When the world comes and try, basically they're bribing you. They're saying, we'll give you this if, because there's always a catch, if you give up this. They'll offer you something. And Saul said unto Samuel, I'm sorry, I was wrong. I shouldn't have let the people do that. Did he repent? No. Look at what Saul does. Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag and the king of the Malachites, and have utterly destroyed the Malachites. Amalek, I'm sorry, brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. Yea, but I have obeyed the word of the Lord. I, the reason I gave you that example of me at the beginning, we went through how important the word is, and how people aren't going to be listening to it, and certain people are, some aren't, is because I, I got corrected on John. Okay? I always point this up with these Trinitarian people out there. I am obeying the word of the Lord. I am obeying the word of the Lord. We say chapter and verse on capital T, Trinity is a title for God or a description of God. Chapter and verse where it says triune, we worship a triune God. Chapter and verse where it says God in three persons. Jesus is called a person, poor, called a person four times in the Bible. God the Father is never called a person. The Holy Spirit is never called a person. Chapter and verse where it says God the Son. God the Holy Spirit. Chapter and verse where it says rapture. Chapter and verse where it says church age. The, we're in the church age. Chapter and verse where it says, The Great Tribulation is a title for that seven-year time period. It says, In those days there shall be great tribulation. It's a description, but it's not a title. Chapter and verse where it says, Millennial Kingdom. 
You say, brother, come on. You're... All it takes is one step, brother, says Christ. One step in the wrong direction. One step. The moment you add anywhere in this Bible once, it becomes addicting. And if I add here, then I can add here. Then I can add here. Then I can add here. And the next thing you know, this is no longer the standard. This is. Yea, hath God said, a better remedy would be. And we run into these people, we're trying to show them the truth. There's times I did it as a jerk. And I'm trying to be more humble. The Bible says, in meekness, instructing them that oppose themselves. Peradventure they might recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. In meekness, your heartfelt desires to see people get built back up and put on the right path. You want people to come to the knowledge of the truth. You want them to get their heart right with the Lord. You don't want to see them utterly destroyed, and you're not mocking them, name-calling, backbiting and whispering, bearing false witness, and all that stuff. But you come across these Trinitarians, and they sit here and say, but I am obeying the word of the Lord. After they just got corrected and told flat out, you're not obeying the Lord. Chapter and verse, it's not in the Bible, but it is in the Bible. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. If the blind lead the blind, they both shall fall into a ditch. If any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant still. What we read up here, they are of the world, therefore speak they are of the world, and the world heareth them. He that is of God heareth God's word, ye therefore hear them not, because you are not of God. We, there's a lot more verses than that, but at one point you got to be like, I'm done with you. Because you don't get it. Look at, look at this. 21, but the people took of the spoils, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. We did this for the Lord. After Samuel just said, you didn't keep the commandment of the Lord. Look at Samuel's response. And this is my response to all the Trinitarians that can't seem to let go. There's some brethren, but I'll say it again because they might not have watched my videos or some of the brethren's videos. There are brethren, and I was one of them, that use Trinitarian terms. They believe the Godhead of the King James Bible, but they were indoctrinated, just the way I was indoctrinated, to say that John was exiled to the Pat to island of Patmos. But it's not actually there. It doesn't actually say it. Okay? We're adding to the scriptures. It doesn't say Trinity. And some of them have come to the truth. I've had a man that just like you could, if you could if he was if it was he was typing a lot. But if he was there, it was almost like he was he was really like he could be spitting in my face. It's the Trinity, it's the Trinity. You're 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 turning your back on God, you're becoming a traitor, you're a heretic. And four or five months down the road he comes back and goes, I sorry, brother, you're right. None of this stuff is in the Bible, and I've been convicted so much. The more I read this book, the more I get convicted saying, I need to say things God's way. It's not there. That's someone who's going down the wrong path, and you're trying to correct him with love and saying, Hey, I want to see you get back on the right path, and he got back on the right path. Thus saith the Lord. Not thus saith my flesh, my feelings, my preferences. Not thus saith the, the world. We can say it the world's way. This is what the world knows it as, so I'm just going to say it the way the world knows it. No, you need to say it the way God said it. And instead of saying also known as, you know, the time of Jacob's trouble, also known as the Great Tribulation, you're still serving the enemy when you say it that way. You're supposed to say, you can say, the time of Jacob's trouble, Daniel's 70th or Daniel's 7th week, falsely called the Great Tribulation. Then people will go, oh, oh, and they can relate the two by saying falsely called the rapture, falsely called trinity, falsely called the millennial kingdom. It's the day of the Lord of the kingdom of heaven. That great day. Okay. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord a, a great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? That's what they started doing in the Old Testament. They started planning their sins and bringing their sacrifices, saying, Oh, I pleased God because I did my animal sacrifice. But in their heart, they had no intentions of obeying the Lord. In their heart, I want that sin. In my heart, I want that sin. I want that. I want that. That's worldly. Idolatry. And so on. Sam, Sam, uh, Saul, uh, Saul is a good example of that. I want what I want, and then I'll just try to make up for it by, you know, sacrificing some animals to the Lord. 
Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. Remember the New Testament talks about we're supposed to be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. I might be missing a few verses, but it's your reasonable service. But we're supposed to be a living sacrifice. But you know what God wants more than a living sacrifice? Men that obey the word of the Lord. You know, when uh, I heard this story from a brother in Christ where a, a young man, almost like a kid, a teenager, he was coming and he was trying to get a job. And the man looked at him and said, you think you're qualified for this? What can you do? And the young man that's trying to get the job said, I know how to do what I'm told. You're hired. You're hired. That's what we need. That's what God's looking for. Especially in men in ministry, that's what God is looking for. He's not looking for men who think they know best, that they can pervert this word so they can live the life that they want to live and do the things they want. He wants men in, in ministry that can say, I know how to do what I am told. Lord, you command, I obey. What do you want, Lord? Thy will be done. I'd like to do this, but what is your will, O Lord? If it be thy will, O Lord. That's what he's looking for. Saul failed miserably. And Samuel's really hammering him with it. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. That's why that woman Jezebel, feminism isn't in the Bible, but the world calls it feminism. The Bible calls it that woman Jezebel. What is it? It's women rebelling against God. The boundaries that God set for them. And that's why, in the, in the past, feminism was related to witchcraft. How did they get that connection? Right here. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. But that goes for anybody. He's calling Saul a is into witchcraft. Anybody that rebels against God and His perfect written word, you're now in the sin of witchcraft. Worldliness. You're doing things the world's way. And stubbornness is... As iniquity and idolatry. Iniquity, sin, idolatry. You turn something down here into an idol. How do you do that, brother? By putting it over the Lord. Remember we said, love not the world, neither the things in the world? When things in this world become more important than the Word of God and your walk with the Lord, keeping His commandments, the Lord and His Word, when the things of this world become more important than ministry, if you're a man called into ministry, when things of this world are more important than your fellowship with the brethren and loving your brothers and sisters in Christ and being there for your brothers and sisters in Christ, I've been stabbed in the back, I've been kicked to the curb by brethren who choose Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games, satanic style music, anime, holidays, holidays, holidays. They even admit, hell, hell a day, Christmas, it's just, you know, it's just culture. It's just Christian admit, It's no commandment of God. So you're saying it's something of the world. But you're holding that something of the world above the Lord. And above your brothers and sisters in Christ. Above the ministry. It becomes idolatry. When something down here becomes more important than the Lord. In Saul's case, pleasing the people. The people became more important than the Lord. It was idolatry. But the people wanted this, and the people wanted that, and i got to have the praise of men above the praise of the Lord. Remember that with the Pharisees, and the Sadducees, and the scribes, but mainly the Pharisees? They loved the praise of men above the praise of the Lord. What happened? These men became idolatries, idols. They became more important than the Lord. Idolatry and iniquity. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. What does idolatry always do? It gets you to handle the word. If you're a man in ministry, it gets you to handle the word of God deceitfully. If you're not in ministry, what does it do? It gets you to turn your back on this book. It gets you to be one of those people that seek teachers out having itching ears. I want this, therefore, and I reject what the Bible actually says, so I need to find a group that will tell me what I want to hear i got to find a book that will tell me what I want to hear. Idolatry and sin and wickedness, iniquity. Remember, thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. So when you're getting into sin hardcore, what does that mean? You're not getting into God's word hardcore. I can guarantee it. I speak from experience. 
There's times where I fell away from the Lord and my walk with the Lord, and I got distracted by the lust of the flesh. I got distracted by the world. I got fed up with the enemy. Instead of standing my ground, I just said, I'm done, and I, I stepped back. And I'm like, what is that? You're rejecting the word of the Lord. You need to stand for it. You need to stand, stand, stand. Right? There's times where this stuff gets in the way of us standing for the Lord. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Sin, wickedness, idolatry will get in the way of you keeping this word in your heart. Once again, uh, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Why don't they want to take heed according to thy word? Remember John 3.16? They don't like to keep reading. They read about how God so loved the world. But don't read how this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Neither cometh they to the light, lest their deeds should be reproved. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Why is this book attacked so much? Why is God's commands and God's word attacked so much today? Because people don't want a changed life. They don't want true biblical salvation. They don't want the changed life. They don't want it. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. And then Saul said, I, I've sinned, and for I've transgressed the commandment of the Lord in thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now therefore I pray thee, pardon my sin. Wait, wait. He sinned against God, but he's telling Samuel to pardon his sin, not God. And turn again with me, Samuel, that I may worship the Lord. Just in one ear and out the other. Whew, right over his head. And you're going to come across people like that. Okay. Mark 7, 6 says, He answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied to you hypocrites, as it is written, These people honor me with their lips. We just heard that. But their heart is far from me. The Bible says, Though with the, mouth, uh, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We've gone over this time and time again where it keeps talking about the heart. The heart, it's always a heart issue. And, and the heart issue is talking about how they live their life. The Bible says, trust the Lord with all thine heart. What are we supposed to be hiding in our heart? Living it. If you're living God's words because you trust the Lord. If you're not living this, you don't trust the Lord. What gets in the way? And lean not on your own understanding. But their hearts are far from me. Saul's heart was so far from God that it was just like you're talking to a brick wall. The Bible talks about not casting that which is holy among the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they turn around and rend you. If any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Now before we get to the third part, this is where we're going to get into Saul. The whole point of this study was did, did, uh, who came up. Was it Saul that came up, or was it an evil spirit just pretending to be Saul? God showed me something interesting, and I want, you know, I want to share it with you, brothers and sisters in Christ. 1 Samuel 15, 34. You turn to 1 Samuel 15, 34. Actually, we're already here, right here. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house to Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Now the question that people get in question is the his here. Who's the his here? The first thing you would say is, it's Samuel. I don't believe it's talking about Samuel. And I'm going to do my best to prove it. And if you disagree, show me in the scriptures. But Samuel came no more to see Saul. Now the subject's on Saul until the day of Saul's death. His death. I think it's talking about Saul. And I'll show you why. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord repented that he had made Saul king over Israel. Now, 1 Samuel 25.1. You can flip over there to 1 Samuel 25.1. It says, And Samuel died. This is when Samuel died. And, the, and all the Israelites were gathered together and lamented him, and buried him in the house of Remah. 
and David arose. Now I understand Saul's an Israelite and Dave's an Israelite, but remember, they're in conflict. They're warring against each other. They both can't be there. Who was there? David was. And David arose. Saul wasn't there on the day of Samuel's death. But they always try to show that he was. He was. All, you watch the movies, and when people preach, you know, Samuel came and saw Saul, and then, that, and then died. Or Saul came and saw Samuel, and then he died. No. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. Let's see. Paran. Period. And I put here, if David was there, then Saul was not there. Because Saul was hunting David. David wouldn't have showed up. And there in the end, Saul was hunting down Samuel and David. Because there was a story of 1 Samuel 19, 20 through 24. This is a good example of not wrestling the scriptures to your own destruction. Because when you read it, it said, you read the whole story about how Saul sent some men out to this area where Saul and Samuel were. And these men fell on their knees and uh, rent their clothes and start uh, prophesying. And then he sent another group of people and the same thing happened to them. And then finally he went himself to Samuel and King David. And he rent himself and was naked on the earth, prophesying. And people say, wait a minute. We just read up there in 1 Samuel 15 that Samuel came to war to see Saul until the day of his death. Samuel didn't go to see Saul. At first I'm like, Lord, I, I trust your word. It's right. That's the good heart to have, brothers of Christ. Your word is right. How do I... Oh, that's right. Saul was seeking out King David, and Samuel happened to be there, but Saul was seeking out David. Saul came to them. Samuel never came to Saul. Saul sought out Samuel. Samuel did not come to see Saul. Now, let's get into this. Remember the context here. Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death, and I believe it's Saul that's talking about, not Samuel. Saul. The day of Saul's death. And I'll show you why. And uh, uh, Saul was not there when Samuel died. So let's get into 1 Samuel 28. Get over to 28. Almost done. 28, 1 through 18. Of course, we're going to be reading a while. <laughs> How much do you guys love the Word of God? I do. So I don't mind. And it came to pass in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for warfare to fight against, with Israel. That's the reason I started in verse 1. I just want you to know this is the context. The Philistines are gathering themselves to fight against Israel. And Achish said unto David, Know thou assuredly that thou shalt go out with me in battle, thou and thy men? And David said to Achish, Surely thou shalt know what thy servant can do. And God got, got David out of it where he wasn't killing his own people. And Achish said to David, Therefore will I make thee keeper of my head forever. Now verse 3. Now Samuel was dead. Remember, he said, Samuel died back in 25. This is 28. He died in 25. Now Samuel was dead, and all Israel had lamented him, and buried him in Ramah, even in the own city. And Saul had put away those that, in his own city. So they're saying, this already happened. But like I said, David was there, but King Saul wasn't there. I believe he wasn't there. And Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. And the Philistines gathered themselves together and came to pitch in Shushan. And Saul gathered at Israel together, and they pitched in Gilboa. And when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart greatly trembled. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urims, nor by prophets. Now you might think that this is also a contradiction, because we read over here that one of his... Also for asking counsel of one that hath the familiar spirit to inquire of it, and inquired not of the Lord. Well here it almost sounded like he was inquiring of the Lord. What it's saying is, is before this event... Other things. It's, 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 it's not that just right now, this event, the Philistines are coming and now God won't listen to them. No, God cut them off a ways back. I believe this is talking about God cut me off and I tried asking his help for this area over here. I tried to seek him for this over here. I tried. He just cut me off. And now the Philistines are coming and what does he do? He doesn't even go to the Lord. He's gotten so used to the Lord not talking to him because his heart is hardened. He's holding iniquity in his heart. Remember that iniquity? And idolatry. I forgot to mention this. Iniquity. King David said, If I hold iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. That goes for both saved and lost. If you're holding iniquity and idolatry in your life, God's not going to hear your prayers. 
oh, come on, I think you're wrong, brother. But you can think you're, I'm wrong all you want. When you're holding iniquity in your heart, not that you can, I can sin and fall on my knees and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have thought that. I shouldn't have said that. Lord, I'm supposed to be humble. I'm supposed to be in meekness instructing those. I shouldn't have been mouthing off. I shouldn't have been name calling. I shouldn't have been mocking. And so on. So I'm supposed to be in meekness. You can, you can sin and say, Lord, I'm sorry. You're not holding in your heart when you humble yourself. The Bible says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What's holding in your heart is when you say, I don't see a problem with what I did. I don't see a problem with what I said. I have no problem with my way. I have no problem with idolatry. I have no problem with iniquity, lust of the flesh, worldliness. I have no problem with Satan's way of doing things. That's when they're holding sin in their heart, and now God won't hear their prayers. Saul was so hardened, he held sin in his heart, and God's not hearing his prayers. I believe that's what this is talked about. There's no contradiction in the Bible. The Bible is truth. So he got used to, okay, God's not listening to me, God's not listening to me, God's not listening to me. Okay, now these Philistines are coming, and what's he do? Then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit. He doesn't even try to seek God anymore. He just got to the point where his heart's so hardened, I'm not going to seek God anymore. I tried. I inquired of the Lord. And the Lord doesn't answer me, and the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urims, nor by prophets. He's come in cut off completely. So he seeks out a familiar spirit. That I may go to her and inquire of her, and his servants said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment. When I read this, but this is Christ, just a little sight. When I read this, it reminds me of the daughter, I think the, the wife of Jeroboam. When she comes to the prophet that told Jeroboam that he was going to be king and that he'd get ten tribes to himself. She disguises herself to come in and try to deceive the man of God. See, the world, this woman here got deceived at first. But you can't deceive a man of God. Okay. She put on a disguise and came in. As soon as she came in, he says... Welcome, thou, thou wife of Jeroboam. Why feignest thou to be another? Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment, and he went, and, and the two men with him, and they came to the woman by night, and he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring him up whom I shall name unto thee. And the woman said unto him, Behold, thou knowest that Saul hath done what Saul hath done, how he hath cut off those that have familiar spirits and the wizards of the land. Wherefore then layest thou a snare for me, for my life, to cause them to die? See, at one point, Saul was in a standing position. He was doing right by the Lord. He was keeping God's commandments. But over time, he failed God and his heart, heart got hardened by sin. It was iniquity and idolatry. And Saul sware to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. And I have to stop there again, just to go off on another little tangent. It's like, that don't mean nothing coming from Saul. Remember what the Bible says? You're not to swear by heaven, for it is his throne, neither by earth, for it is his footstool. But we're supposed to be, um, if it be the, yeah, thy will, O Lord, I'd like to do this. If it be thy will, I'd like to do that. If it be thy will, Lord... And you go to the, uh, the book of uh, Judges, I forgot the man's name, but he went to this battle and said, Lord, if you give me victory, the first thing that comes out to meet me, I will sacrifice unto you. It's a vow unto the Lord. Some brethren are like, and some, and some sisters in Christ are like, well, why would God allow something like this to happen? He came home, and the first thing that came out to meet him was what? His daughter. And you know what? He ended up having to sacrifice his daughter to keep his word to the Lord. That's why it's so important that you don't that make swear. I swear by the Lord such and such. You don't vow by God. And why was that important? Because when you get to Saul, and if you remember the story of Jonathan, he went up with his uh, armor bearer, and they wrought a great victory, and then Saul made a decree, and he vowed to the Lord that no man is to eat bread or anything 
for I think like 24 hours or something like that. And he vowed to the Lord that if anybody did, they'd die, they would be put to death. It's a vow unto the Lord. He swear by the Lord. As long as, as the Lord liveth. What did he just say here? As the Lord liveth. What happened? His son Jonathan, he ate a honey. He was to put his son to death because he made the vow to the Lord. He didn't keep it. The Bible says the people saved Jonathan out of the hands of Saul. He didn't keep it. He pleased the people. But here he is making a promise again. The man's word's worthless. Just worthless. Okay. I've come across people like that. They've broken their word so many times that they'll sit there and say, I swear, I swear. Your word means nothing. Your actions speak louder than words. Would we read Luke 11, 20, but he said, Yea, rather blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. I always tell people you're supposed to be a, we got a B right here. They're supposed to be, you're supposed to be a living witness as well as a verbal witness. Well, today people love being a verbal witness, but they have the hardest time being a living witness for Jesus Christ. People should look at you and say, hey, he's separate from the world. That, there's something different about that man. He's not one of us. Talking about the lost world looking at you. That Philip Newton, he's not one of us. Sanctification. He fears God. He does things God's way, keeping God's commandments. He's always acting like he's, he's a representative of Jesus Christ, trying to witness for Jesus Christ, being an ambassador for Jesus Christ, made unto us righteousness. Sanctification. He won't do the things that we do. We love our sin. We have no problem with the sin and wickedness of the world, but he hates it, and he separates himself from it. And Paul, uh, Peter says, be, willing to, be ready to give an answer of the hope that is in you. Redemption. Looking for that blessed hope. Why doesn't he get as fearful as we? Absent from the body, present with the Lord. I know where I'm going to go when I die. You know where you're going to go when you die. Okay? But I just like because it's like, as the Lord liveth... There's supposed to be a difference. Our works need to line up with our words. Remember the parable. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Jesus did a parable about the father and his two sons. He tells the first son, go work in my vineyard. He says, I will not go. Later he repented and went. The second son said, I will go, but then decided I'm not going and he didn't go. Which one did the will of my have his father? The one that went. Your actions will always speak louder than words. You can lose your testimony with your actions. Okay. Uh, I can go off on that, a huge teaching on that. You know, that your actions need to line up with your words, and those words need to line up with this book. Your life and your actions need to line up with this book. As the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up to thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. And that when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. And that's when she realized the deception was taken away. The veil was taken away as far as the deception. And she saw Saul for who he really was. The woman spake to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. And the king said unto her, Be not afraid, for what sawest thou? That's another thing to understand. It could have been the fire, the smoke in the fire. Like they could have thrown some, she could have thrown some incense in the fire, and the smoke comes up, and you see those people, the crystal, the witches with the crystal balls, and they're looking in the ball, and ooh, I see this. Saul's not actually seeing it. Okay, I believe that. I believe it's just something that she's seen. Be not afraid, for what sawest thou? And the woman said unto him, Saul, I saw God ascending out of the earth. And he said unto her, lowercase g gods. He said unto her, What form is, it, is he of? And she said, An old man cometh up, and he's covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived, he didn't see, he perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped his face to the ground and bowed himself. And Samuel said, See, that should be enough for a Bible believer to say it's Samuel, because the Bible says it's Samuel. He doesn't say the, the, the false evil spirit pretending to be Samuel counterfeiting Samuel. No, no. He says, And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? 
Samuel just came up to see Saul. Remember, God didn't have to let this happen. God didn't have to let it happen at all. Samuel came up to see Saul. What did we read up there? Samuel came no, no more to see Saul until the day of his death. He came up to see Saul. And Saul answered, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God has departed from me, and answereth me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore have I called thee, that thou mayest make known unto me what I shall do. Then said Samuel, Wherefore then dost thou ask me, seeing the Lord is departed from thee, and has become thine enemy? See, today there's one meter between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. But you'll get those religious fanatics, organized religion, that they'd rather go to the hireling. They'd rather go to the priest. They'd rather go to whatever. People down here, than go to the Lord. Seeing the Lord is departed from thee, and has become thine enemy. And the Lord hath done to him as he spake by me. For the Lord hath rent the kingdom out of thine hand, and given it to thy neighbor, even to David. Because thou obeyest not the voice of the Lord, nor executeth his fierce wrath upon Amalek, therefore hath the Lord done this thing unto thee this day. This thing unto thee this day. Remember, there's 24 hours in a day. What's, what's Samuel talking about? Let's keep reading. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with thee into the hands of the Philistines, and tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me. Where's Samuel? He's in the earth. He's in Abraham's bosom, which is in hell. But it says he came out of the earth. He's saying that you guys are going to be down here. It doesn't mean that Saul and his sons went to Abraham's bosom. I believe Saul's in hell, the, the fiery sides of hell, the lowest hells the Bible talks about. And thy sons be with me, and the Lord also shall deliver the host of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. Tomorrow shalt thou be, the, and thy sons be with me. You mean 24 hours later, either right on the dot, or less than 24 hours later, Saul was dead? After Samuel came to see Saul, he came up from Abraham's bosom to see Saul, and then within 24 hours he died? Would we read up there? Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. His being Saul. People will say that's Samuel. No, it's Saul. The day that Saul, saw, that Saul died, Samuel came up to see him, up from Abraham's bosom. And in 1 Samuel 28, 20, or 19, let's get to 19. No, we already read 19, 20. Then Saul fell straightway all along the earth and was sore afraid because of the words of Samuel. Once again, the Bible says the words of Samuel. And there was no strength in him, for he had eaten no bread all the day nor all the night. It was Samuel that came up. I was listening to that, and I heard that. I said, wait a minute, it says Saul, Samuel, and I'm not taking credit for it. It was God. I listen to the Word of God as much as I can, and when I'm listening to Alexander Scorvey, there's uh, Alexander Scorvey reading the Word of God out loud. I'll sit there, and I'll pause it for a second, and start talking to the Lord, and say, wait a minute. Did I hear that correctly, Lord? Did you just show me something? Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. And God pricked my heart with my love for the word of the Lord and said, Listen, look into this a little bit. There's something to it. There's something to it. And I looked into it a little bit more. Okay. The Bible is saying that it was Samuel and those were his words and also the prophecy that Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Not a prophecy, but it was saying that that's the last time Samuel saw Saul was the day of his death. The Saul's death. Samuel came up the same day Saul died. He died 24 hours later. Tomorrow you will be with me. You will be with me. So brothers and Christ, stay in the word of God. God will show you some amazing things. And I need to work harder on staying in the word of God as far as um, slipping up and trying. What I'm trying to do is get all that indoctrination out and using words that aren't in the Bible. Okay? I'm trying to say things the way God said. There's nothing wrong with the taking what God said and explaining it. There's not taking words that God said and defining the words. But remember, there's some people that are 
deceptive and they'll take the word that God chose, replace it with the word that they want, and then they give the definition of the word that they just replaced the word of God with and say, oh, and when you call them out for it, they'll be like, oh, it's just defining what God said. No, they weren't. They were trying to be sneaky about replacing God's word with their own word. That's wrong. But you take the word that God chose and you tell people what the, what the definition is. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay? But we need to be careful. We need to stay in the word of God. And when we say, thus saith the Lord, it's the word that matters. And we also need to be careful that we don't make the same mistakes Saul did. Don't let iniquity rule, rule and reign in your heart. I don't believe in a saved person it can, but, you know, because a saved person is spiritually minded, walking after the Spirit, Romans chapter 8, and a lost person is carnally minded, walking after the flesh. That's what Romans 8 is talking about, the difference between the lost world and someone who's saved. Um, I know a lot of brethren in, in the they claim to be Bible believers disagree with me. Oh, no, they're just two types of Christians. No, that's a lost and a safe. But, brother, says Christ, it's so easy to let the lust of the flesh get the better of you. It's so easy to let the world get the better of you and start falling into, like, making things in this world more important than God, idolatry, iniquity, holding iniquity in your heart, and then you start wondering, why isn't God answering my prayers? Well, what iniquity are you holding in your heart? Get it out, so then God will answer your prayers. Don't make the same mistake he did and stay in the Word. God's going to show you things. I'm still learning from the Word to this day. I'm still learning from this book. I'm learning mistakes I'm still making. <laughs> you know, we talked about John. I'm learning about mistakes that I'm still making to this day. And I'm also learning things from this book to this very day. Okay? Stay in the book. Stay in the book. Okay. So I'm going to end this with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Stay in the Word every day. Start your day with the Word of God. End your day with the Word of God. Start your day with prayer. End your day with prayer. Stay in the book, brother, sister Christ. And I will see you in the next study.